Good morning, everyone. My name is John Flynn. I'm the current chair of the, the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat Australia, Brisbane's committee. And on behalf of our committee and our sponsors of this morning's breakfast, Wattpack, it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. For 2017, our, we always have to pick a theme for our breakfast series. This year, we're looking at infrastructure across, across Queensland and New South, New South Wales. Infrastructure is a term we all talk about a lot at the moment, but a bit of research, it really only came into the fore in the 1940s when, after the formation of NATO, the army guys started talking about infrastructure. And then in, by the 1970s, urban planners started picking up on the, on the term infrastructure as being important to cities' developments. And then there was a book written in the 1980s called The Ru America in Ruins, which really focused on the lack of infrastructure through the 50s, 60s and, and 70s and what was happening in America. Now we seem to talk about infrastructure all the time. So today we think of infrastructure as being um, the development of, of facilities for our city. So it's a really interesting topic to cover for this year and gives us a, a really broad range of things to talk about. Today we're discussing the enemy is Velodrome, which is a key piece of infrastructure for the Queensland sporting industry. And it's been delivered as part of the Commonwealth Games. And it's kind of a timely day to be talking about it when the baton relay started on, in London on Monday. So it's, uh, it's very topical. The Gold Coast 2018 Commonwealth Games will host 18 different world-class sport in sporting venues. There's been facilities built on the Gold Coast, there's facilities in Brisbane, Cairns and Townsville. As part of that infrastructure build-up for the Games, we've built three new facilities, and obviously today we're talking about one of those facilities. And it's pretty amazing, you look on the line, the statistics they're predicting in terms of the benefits to Queensland of, of hosting the Commonwealth Games. They're talking about an injection of $2 billion into the economy, $200 million in new sporting infrastructure, 330,000 full-time equivalent jobs over that period, short period, mate. Uh, a global television audience, over 1 billion people, more than 100,000 of visitors to the Gold Coast during the period, and obviously we get upgraded sporting facilities, and uh, there's also an opportunity here to volunteer, it's set on the website, so I think that might have closed, but if you want to volunteer, you can get out there. So later on in the morning, we'll have uh, Alistair Hall from Arabs and Al Alex Lease from Cox talking about the... Uh, Anamir's Velodrome, which is a 250 metre indoor, beautiful looking structure. Um, events like this today aren't possible without the generous support of our sponsors. And it's today I mentioned Wattpack are our sponsors. And Wattpack is a, multi a national multidisciplinary construction and mining contracting group listed on the Stock Exchange. Wattpack commenced operations in Brisbane, which is great to see, in 1983, and now has grown to have offices in Brisbane, Townsville, Sydney, Port Macquarie, Melbourne, Adelaide, and Perth. They're very proud of their 34 years history of constructing buildings around Australia. Wattpac have constructions have delivered a large and complex variety of projects and they're recognised through a lot of industry awards and professional excellencies. Wattpac employ over a thousand people around the country and it's quite amazing. The list of uh, sports facilities Wattpac have delivered, and I'll read them, is, is the Ballymore East Grandstand, we all know, the Gabba Cricket Ground, Suncorn Stadium, Seabus Stadium, Rabina, the Riverways Sporting Stadium in Tharangawa, Metricon Stadium in Carrara, the National Cricket Centre at Albion, the Gold Coast Aquatic Centre at Southport, and the Anamir's Velodrome. So it's quite an impressive uh, uh, collection of sporting infrastructure throughout Australia, Queensland mainly. Um, at the end of today's pre presentation, Ross Jarden from Wattpac will be up here to give the, the vote of thanks. Today's breakfast will follow our traditional, I'll stand up here and give you a bit of news, sit down, you'll get to enjoy your breakfast about five to eight, I'll be up and formally introduce our two speakers. We'll have a presentation for 40, 45 minutes and then 10 minutes of questions and have you back to your offices by uh, nine o'clock to uh, start work, which is always good. Um, in terms of advertorial, our next breakfast seminar is here on uh, Thursday the 25th of May and we've got uh, Keith Lloyd and Adam Davies from Hassel presenting the Hurston Quarter Master Plan. A lot of us have heard about Hurston Quarter and been trying to get work there. This is our chance to actually see what's happening um, and how it's all come about. In terms of joining the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, the, the membership forms are online. For your $150 US a year, you get weekly council updates, access to the monthly videos, and access to the whole uh, website. So it's worth, worth joining up. In terms of what caught my attention around on the Council's website this last month, uh, Melbourne's tallest building has been approved. Um, it's the 90 storey tower designed by a UK based Wilkinson Air, who are also doing the Sydney Casino Tower as well, which is, so they're doing two major towers in Australia. The tower is located on Queen's Bridge Street opposite the casino, and they're proposing to have a bridge straight across into the gambling floors from the building for the, for the, for the residents. It holds 388 hotel rooms and 700 odd apartments. As always, it amazes me in Melbourne, they have planning restrictions, but this building's 324 metres high 
and has a plot ratio of 57 to 1. The, when this was designed, the current uh, plot ratio in Melbourne was meant to be 24 to 1. It's since been wound back to 18 to 1. So in terms of pushing the boundary of Melbourne, you can pay a contribution to the public realm. And the, um, this project is delivering $100 million worth of community benefits to um, increase that plot ratio. So I just, each time we have one of these buildings, they seem to push the boundaries further and, and further. The Gold Coast has a similar scheme, but I don't think we, you can get to spend that much money in terms of pushing the, pushing the infrastructure. But still, good to see an interesting building being built in Brisbane, in Melbourne. Probably more controversial one in Melbourne is Collins Arch. I think I've showed this a few times, but it's actually managed to start construction in, in the last year, so it's actually happening. If, this building is design, joint, joint designed by New York-based shop architects and Woods Baggett. It's been around since 2014 when the first tower was proposed, a 295 single tower, and that was rejected by the planning authorities in there, so they basically took the building and bent it, bent it over to create the, the, Colin, the Collins Arch. When the first arch appeared, it was still too tall, they thought, so they've, you know, they've um, manipulated the shape and the height. And the, the concern was overshadowing a public space, which is a, a valid concern. But you can see how here how the architects in, have manipulated the building formed, obviously, to, to deal with the shadow angles and, and get, get reduced, obviously reducing the height, dealing with the shadow angles by uh, angling the building. And it got approved and has started, started construction. But it's also interesting, the council supported the earlier version of this but the state government being the planning authority for taller buildings down there objected. So the council was involved in a petition online and the architects and developers to get public support for what they thought was a unique building for Melbourne and obviously public pressure, pressure run out, won out in the end. And following the theme of uh, interesting buildings, this one is the reverse of what we've just seen. This is the Ritz-Carlton at the Star Casino in Sydney, which this was Sydney, all those big projects in Sydney have the uh, design excellence competition. And this was the winning entry. It's designed by FJMT, a, a Sydney practice. It was selected unanimously by a five-panel expert review of all the entries, but they narrowly beat uh, BVN and Grimshaw's schemes. It's 228 metres tall, modest 220 hotel rooms and 150 apartments. But what's interesting is the building actually grows as it gets taller and the shape twists and rotates. Again, the, the, the architect's the design rationale behind that is, is actually allowing light into public space and views around. So, Buildings down low look around a smaller building. As it gets higher, it's not blocking views. It, it expands and the tops are rotated to provide daylight. So two very interesting approaches to actually providing daylight into, into public spaces. So this has been built in comp competition to uh, the Crown Casino Wilkinson Air Tower, which is on the other side of Barangaroo. So you've got two quite unique uh, buildings being built around Sydney. And there's three projects that are all driven around casinos. So it's interesting how the integrated resorts are uh, certainly driving the Australian construction at the moment. Um, very exciting news, and I think there's a flyer on your table, is the uh, Council on Tall Buildings has announced um, the conference is coming to Australia this year, which is really exciting for us. A lot of work for the committees in Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne to help organise, but it's, uh, it's the second time it's been in Australia. It was in Melbourne t over 20, 20 years ago, and that's how this committee was spun out of that, that, um, the, the conference back in, in Melbourne years ago. The theme for it is connecting cities, people, density and infrastructure. Again, even the Council on Tall Buildings is understanding the need. It's not all about tall buildings anymore. The idea of infrastructure and public realm and, and streets is, is very, very important. Um, there's, the, in terms of membership at the moment, hopefully come to this conference, there's 925 organisations who are members and there's over 1.2 million of those organisations. They employ about 1.2 million people. So there's a lot of people that get the newsletters, see these presentations and hopefully will come to the to the conference. Out of each conference, we always, they always produce the, the journal of all the, all the presentations and reports. Great reading if you uh, can't go to the conference. And, uh, the uh, conference last year was in Shenzhen, and it, in China, and it moved to three different locations. Each night you jumped on a bus, each morning you jumped on a bus and went to a different city for a series of presentations. A logistical nightmare, apparently, but uh, people who went there said it was fascinating to experience the Chinese system moving, moving you around. Sydney, the Australian conference is actually happening in Sydney for three days, a day and a half in Brisbane, a day and a half in Melbourne, but the day of Melbourne and Sydney are in Brisbane are in parallel, so you've got to choose which one you want to go to, so that'll be, be interesting. But in terms of the China, there was 1,350, 1350 delegates from sort of over 46 countries that attended, and it was a mix of engineers and architects and um, a lot of Chinese, but a lot of people from around the world. In terms of Sydney, where the council's ambition is a little bit more modest, it's hopefully a 800 to 1,000 people attending. But again, they think there's probably 40% of the, the attendees will come out of Australia and the rest will come from Asia and, and the US. 
apparently it's a fair flight from America to here, and the Americans think Asia is much closer than Australia, so they're actually marketing quite heavily in America, saying Australia's not that far away, which is good. As I mentioned, the conference starts, it starts in Sydney on the uh, Sunday night. There's two days of presentations um, with about 150 speakers over those two days, is the current strategy. On the Wednesday in Sydney, there's tours around a series of a series of key Sydney buildings, including Backer House too, as the Opera House, to get people in and seeing what's been happening in, in Sydney. And then day, half of th Thursday and Friday, you either choose to come to Melbourne or you come to Brisbane. I thought the Brisbane photo was much more enticing than the Melbourne photo, which was good. And our committee is currently working on a, a, a one and a half day program of, of presentations and visits to some of our key buildings. So we're hoping to get 100, 150 people to that in Brisbane and similar number to Melbourne. So it's a, it's a very exciting opportunity um, happening from the 30th of October to the 3rd of uh, November, just finishing the time for Melbourne Cup. If you get in early before May, it's only 800 US dollars to, uh, to attend if you're, if you're a member. Great value for a three and a half day conference. But, um, so the, it's actually live on the council's website now, so you can go and uh, book your place now so you don't miss out. But um, it should be very, very exciting. And there is the website, which you all should know, hopefully. So um, it's worth having a look at the website. There's a lot more detail on there than I've just skimmed over, but it's a great opportunity for us to all to get involved and learn from an international audience. So that's the end of my uh, uh, news for the week. I'll be back after about 8 o'clock to introduce our two speakers. Thanks, guys.